for saying the bar way too high. Uh, so, cool. super excited to be here for, to show my project for Room 12 Technologies. This is like really cool. Maybe like some of y'all do it a lot, but I'm stoked to be here. Um, and I think I got this one. I got the, got the thing sharing, got this interview going. And yeah, oh, cool. All right. Um, I'm sharing uh, the screen, but I have a video to shoot too, but uh, that's okay. I can recover. So, ooh, stop sharing. Uh, there should be a link to share my entire screen. All right. Cool. Uh, so we're going to get the ghost effect here, uh, which is the whole thing you want to do. You're also going to see my presenter notes, and it's really not a big deal. Um, just ignore me. We're all switching. The point is, I'm going to give a little context for this thing I've been working on. Uh, can you uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, without this, I'll just Oregon, programmatic control of a joy con. Uh, and I had a kind of chicken egg problem because the talk doesn't make a lot of sense, sense without some context, but the video that I can show you doesn't make a lot of sense without the talk. So I'm just going to I'm just going to split it. So I'm going to play a little bit of this video and then get to the talk. But uh, the point is, I press space. So we should be all right. Cool. So you got me. You got my hand. Give me the thumbs up. And you see I am typing on the computer. Uh, and what you're going to notice is. This, this Nintendo Switch here, Nintendo Switch, who has a Nintendo Switch, who is used to play, anyway, it's a game console. Um, and you know, this, this is happening on this Nintendo Switch, and it seems to be lining up with these log lines. Uh, pressing A, pressing A, uh, and in fact, it's pressing A uh, on this, which you're going to learn all about this in the next few minutes. Uh, but what is happening here is uh, this laptop, SSH in to this Raspberry, which is tickling a custom digital circuit, uh, which is tickling this piece of hardware right here, which is controlling the game. Uh, and this is not, this is totally for fun, no profit to be had at all. Uh, but anyway, I just wanted to show that. So now I'm going to switch back to the slides. Okay, great. Uh, so, for you, from my control, what on. So I went to the video. Right. So, uh, it's my most my cool little tech project. I have this slide. Uh, I'll get background and then I'll get major components of the project, which enables the cool clip you saw recently. Uh, and it is a Python talk, so you don't have to do it again to just have a game. All right. Show uh, now. Recognize this screen. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you. Uh, Glad to see. For those of you who don't know, this is a game called Pokemon Red or Blue. Uh, it was either, I don't know which. Uh, but it came out in the 90s. A super fun game. I was the right age. Uh, well, I still enjoy it today, but I was especially the right age then to enjoy such a game uh, for game. Uh, actually, this game uh, really, really interesting to program a game on the constraints of the Game Boy. Uh, there are all kinds of posts for crazy glitches that happen. Uh, totally. Obviously, it glitches on intentionally, but it does amazing things that you wouldn't think a bug should do. Uh, so this isn't that talk, but it's done, but just Google like Pokemon missing number. It's really cool content. But this talk is not about that. It's that guy on the right. So this is Pokemon Let's Go, which is a remake. Uh, it is an attempt at what I call nostalgia dollars uh, for people like me who kind of want to hold on to the awesomeness of the past and are willing to pay for it. Uh, so, as you can see, a very similar setup. This is a new game made just a couple of years ago, 2018, 2017. Uh, and it's a remake of Pokemon Red and Blue with better graphics. It has some new mechanics, which this project is focused on to kind of keep things fresh. Uh, but it's sort of got all the nostalgia stuff with some new stuff, too. Uh, so, why, why I talk about that? One more thing I'll talk about is. Uh, as opposed to the Game Boy, this one is controlled by called a Joy-Con. So if you have Nintendo Switch, you know what that is. That is a controller uh, for the Switch. You can see it's wireless. You've got like, your 
say. It's kind of small compared to the hands, uh, and it's on the go. So, like, when you're at the pool party, you can, like, whip out your Nintendo Switch and, like, play Mario Kart and stuff. That's, like, the whole thing. Uh, but this is going to be important later on. This is what controls the game. So, okay, why do I care? Well, it turns out, in this game, if you want to have, like, the best open amount possible, uh, you can farm a special item in the game, which are called gold bottle caps. doesn't matter, uh, but the backstory is, if you find gold bottle caps in the world, which are rare, you take them along with your Pokemon to a non-player non character in the game. He makes your Pokemon awesome in exchange for the gold bottle cap. So I, I wrote this off the website, uh, and they're, they're all kinds of websites like this throughout the internet because people with the Pokemon want to farm these gold bottle caps. Uh, so I do a tutorial. It turns out uh, the way you do it is to walk around the room and pick up six items and then if you're lucky you have nothing you want uh, if you get the item you want you can do what's called a soft reset uh, so it's kind of like in the Game Boy version if you have a boss button that's not going your way uh, you can power to the game turn it back on it comes to the last save when you're, you're ready to roll the dice again uh, but the point is it's rare right uh, so wouldn't it be nice if there were a way to automate this, said no regular person ever, except for me, uh, and I did. So uh, the, the whole guiding post for the technical challenge is how to automate these steps on the switch. We need to be able to uh, to a thing and move our character around, pick things up. But it's also going to have a mini game, which I need to do with the reset for. Uh, we're going to need to press our buttons. Does any game lots of buttons need to be pressed? Uh, and then, uh, kind of those things, it's going to need to read the screen. Because there's been a hard code in this waypoint to pick up a special item. I need to know if I got the special item so I can stop and send me an email or, you know, do whatever. Uh, so, yes, that, that is the context. That is the goal. These are the things we are going to achieve somehow. All right, so the first section of the signpost, the joy con. So, uh, some games are kind of easy to automate, like if you run them on your computer, you just like have a scripting interface or something like this. Joy-Con's not made for that. Joy-Con's made for casual play. Uh, so, but it turns out there are other people who at one time or another had my interest of uh, figuring out how to do technical things to this. Uh, so there is sort of the home online for reverse engineering the Nintendo Switch Joy-Con. Uh, and a modeler named Deku Nukem. I don't know their real name, and I think that is they did that on purpose. Uh, but if you go there, github.com slash Deku Nukem, uh, you can see the place online for reverse engineering the Nintendo Joy-Con. So shout out to them. And what you will find there, among many other things, is a little circuit diagram. So uh, these are circuit boards, CDs, and if you were to use your experiment to join on, so 80 bucks for the pair, actually. Uh, and open them up and probably spread them along the way. Uh, you will find, among other things, uh, these two boards inside. And uh, there, there's some other stuff here, too. Like one of these is a Bluetooth uh, receiver for actually connecting to the, to the game. Uh, you can see a couple of buses here, which we'll see later on, for uh, connecting to the console or connecting to the like, little letter. Right here. Actually, pretty soon, y'all can take it if you want. But that you're going to call it like uh, when you do things, and uh, that's uh, this one right here. So anyway, the um, point is, this is called reverse engineered many of what's called the test forms. So you see like the copper pins here. Um, when it's being manufactured, uh, I learned while doing this, uh, a lot of times, any of the crash people in the room, by the way, okay, so I apologize. Um, and you can tell me after, or I can make you take assumptions, uh, as far as I know, these copper test points, I think they're just mainly for QA, uh, maybe on other things. So, on the way, uh, fabricating the circuit is a complex process. If you're wrong, as you know, from being in the processors, if uh, you press the button and it didn't come out quite right, and on Intel i7, and it's an i5, then you just wire off the thing, right? Uh, so, anyway, uh, people actually do QA. With these test points, and what they are, exposed 
parts of the digital circuit. You can actually take a wire, press it on these copper pads, and hook it up to an oscilloscope or a multimeter or any kind of other engineering tool you have, and actually run some tests on it to make sure it's shippable. Uh, so, uh, before moving on to this slide, the same here. Uh, I don't know if I said this is the left Joy-Con, by the way, this is the right Joy-Con. Uh, they remade this one actually, and uh, I was quite displeased to find out that this didn't apply to the new $80 thing I had just bought, and I had to like go find another one. Uh, but see, they're all easy, that's cool. So, how it works is kind of like um, how, how a button usually works in a circuit is like you press it down, it breaks conductivity, and to the digital components in the circuit, that breaking of conductivity or bridging of conductivity, depending on which convention you go to, is a button press. So you little zap, and then the button is pressed downstream. The components know it's a button press. This is a little different. It's like a keypad. Uh, if you have on like an alarm system, like the get in. Point is, uh, for a button press, you bridge the circuit. So if you have this all powered up, which I'll show in a bit, uh, bridging, for example, uh, let me find one. I'm looking for like A, B, Y, I'm looking for. Oh, right. So this, this is. This is like up, down, left, right. So, like bridging this little pad right here uh, to a little button called call, which is right here, then you like to button press. So, take the jumper cable, stick it in, button press. All right. Uh, right. So, so I have a few users who take this, and if you ask one more time, they'll be here after the show. Um, so, we're talking about button. We're kind of like half of there to get this automated. Oh, uh, it means that the joystick, that's a more complicated than what I described. It's not like the, this is like the pressing, the completing of a circuit, this binary thing. A joystick has, you know, a range of motion, right? And how that's encoded uh, in many applications, this one included, is a range of visual voltages. So you can see here, it's tiny, this, this is actually from the Joy-Con, right? This tiny little ribbon cable. Uh, it has five copper wires there. That is for source voltage, ground, x-axis, y-axis, and press. Like, you can press these things. Uh, like, you can press this down. Oh, jeez. <laughs> is this how it's supposed to have been the whole time? No, we can hear you fine. You can hear me fine? Yeah. Uh, okay, cool. <laughs> uh, right. So, anyway, another thing we'll be talking about shortly is uh, automating the button presses, but also automating the joysticks. Okay. Uh, so this is sort of the, the minimum viable product for the thing I wanted to build. And I, I was proud, so I took a picture. Uh, what you can see here is, here's a Joy-Con. Um, I went through six pairs of Joy-Cons doing this. So in the name of, in the name of science, uh, I, have, I have broken a lot of Joy-Cons. Um, but anyway, you'll see, uh, there, there's the uh, left Joy-Con right here. And then on the side here, I left a little assembly with this letter A I was alluding to. A couple of ribbon cables connected via the PCB to the, to the component over here. It's powered up a lot of time. So there's, there's a retailer called Spark and they make a bunch of cool stuff for hardware and uh, And then, yeah, you'll see it's wired up here. And then the joystick uh, is actually pulled out to the breadboard. So I can start checking signals into it. And you'll see my little guy, Ash, is running into the upper left. So that's just what happens uh, when Ash is in an open circuit. So when you yank out the joystick, uh, the circuit no longer has a property that the electricity is going through the joystick. So the voltage on the circuit is just undefined. Uh, and without doing anything, he runs up into the left. Uh, but actually, if you bridge high voltages or low voltages, in this context, since it always matters. Uh, Joy-Con runs at 1.8 volts. So if you bridge higher low voltages per that metric to these points, the guy will actually run in a different direction. So for the x-axis um, and the y-axis, zero to 1.8 volts, you kind of go in the middle for neutral. So applying 0.8 volts makes him stand still on that axis, and zero is one way and 1.8 is the other way. Uh, okay, cool. So on to the circuit. So, uh, signposting here, what we've done so far is kind of found a way to digitally tickle uh, this thing which was not meant to be sort of explored in this way. What 
I'm trying, I'm just conveying the fact that uh, this thing can be controlled with electrical impulses, which kind of like gets me part of the way there. But we're not all the way there because I want to like control this with software, right? I don't want to like uh, have a person touching the jumper cables. I'd rather just push the button. So I kind of need some stuff in between uh, the PCB and the software. So there was actually a little bit of circuit work I had to do. And uh, I'm a software person uh, in experience. Uh, so apologies and again for anything I misexplained. Uh, but this uh, is conceptually at least easy to understand because I could understand it. Uh, you can focus on, on one of these guys here. There's, there's a little array of four identical things here. One of them is what's called a single pole double throw switch. And remember I was talking about on the circuit, pressing a button is bridging two parts of the circuit, taking a little jumper wire and going point A, point B, it's a button press. So this is starting to look like a way to bridge the circuit based on the programmatic output, right? You've got the input here. Based on the input, uh, this thing is connected to D1, for example, connected to either S1 or S2, right? So uh, you can imagine default configuration and open circuit with an input with an impulse bridge into that special place I said, we got a button press. So, so this you can get online for like less than three press. So the next part is the joystick though. So the joystick, a uh, little trick here, as I was alluding to, it's not a binary it's a range. Uh, so I had an opportunity to learn about a low level information exchange protocol. So I guess there's a networking level model, this OSI model of seven layers and I had never been to this layer before, uh, but there is a thing called, shoot, and I, I really wish I had two notes up here because that's what's one. It's either I2C or something else. Thank you. All right, thank you, thank you. Uh, so there's a thing called I2C, uh, which exchanges information to this chip. Uh, so for example, the interface to this chip, uh, I'll talk about what it does. I'll look at the interface first. The inter I, I should see what it does first. Um, what it does is it takes an input voltage and a specification. And the specification is what fraction of this voltage is applied to the other. So we got a little input here, VCC. If I say give half of the voltage, then this output here, if the input is 1.8 volts, will be 0.9 volts, and that might be good for my application. So the I squared C protocol, I just learned this I squared C right now, uh, cool, cool facts. Um, these two wires uh, are hooked up and exchange information uh, over time. It is cool, but like, um, they're two wires, right? They're just, they're just analog signal that you can kind of read a number off of, but applied over time in a convention protocol, you actually exchange an integer, uh, and that integer represents the ratio of the voltage I actually want. Um, so anyway, the uh, point is, specification goes in on these two wires, you'll see me tickle it with Python later. Uh, partial voltage comes out, and that partial voltage, based on my software, might be uh, zero volts, which in some contexts means go left, or it might be 1.8 volts, which in some contexts means go right, or it might be 0.85 volts, I think is what I found, which in some contexts means stay still on the axis. Uh, yeah, I didn't expect anyone to read this, but it's there, and uh, there will be a link to it at the end. Uh, so this is actually roughly the circuit I put together. We have uh, the RASPI GPI open. Does anyone have experience with RASPI or GPI? Or, yeah. So it's, it's just some very accessible way to tickle hardware, uh, and the GPI open array is, is represented here. And the, the digital analog converters, that little red motherboard with the small chip inside, uh, they're both represented here. And then the other thing are the switches. Uh, so eight switches, five of which I use. And then these are actually connections to that green PCB that I was talking about earlier, A, B, X, and Y. And I was just there, and there we go. my beautiful work of art. Uh, that, that was a diagram. This is the actual thing. Um, I have it right here, actually. So if anyone wants to take a look after they can. Uh, but yeah, this, is, this was a combination of a lot of work and research for me. Uh, you got the, got the two DACs here. They handle the X and Y axes from the joystick. Uh, you got the actual Joy-Con, which is all summed up uh, to various parts of the breadboard. You have on the breadboard the two sets of switches, and those switches are the thing that can additionally bridge the circuit to do the button presses. 
So this, this is like we're, we're almost it's uh we're almost at the end of how it works. So the wrap up. So we've talked about the Joy-Con. We've talked about the circuit that starts making everything a little bit more accessible, but now we're kind of ready to hook it up in software and software can actually do stuff with it. So the rest of the <clears throat> sorry to do that. The rest of is how I solved a problem with getting input. So I've been studying this issue the whole presentation for to achieve my desired goal of getting gold bottle caps, uh, I need a way to know if I've succeeded or not to actually halt the program. There's a halting problem joke in there, but I didn't take the time to make it. So <laughs> you can just, it was funny, hypothetically. <laughs> um, so how much do you input, right? So there's something called a capture bar. Now that you watch streamers online, uh, but they'll be playing their console and people will watch them all with them. And the way that works is HDMI is fed into this third party device. Uh, the signal is carried to the TV, but it's also keyed off digitally to a computer, which can then process it and upload it to Twitch or YouTube or wherever. And I would try to do this, uh, but I mean, you can see there's a proprietary digital for it, Raspire comes on ARM. Uh, you just need to use a Debian alternative. So these cards and these drivers are most proprietary, most of them are closed source. I'm like, what am I going to do? Uh, the red is not that powerful, right? It's like, you, you know, I, pro I probably can't take one frame per second. These are 60 frames a second. So I didn't really know what to do. And then I thought I had a webcam lying around. So this is what I did. Uh, and it, I'm, I'm pleased to report this was adequate for my application. Um, so you can see I have a webcam here. I have a little studio with my laptop uh, case and the, 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 the console unit there. Uh, and then it's propped up in Firefly DVDs with a couple of coasters. And really, not that's um, what you can do there is get pictures. All right, I don't know, right? Um, before I move on to the Python, I want to say something I don't have a slide for, uh, which is these pictures give me an image I can logic on. Uh, and as you've seen a bit, uh, the logic is based on whether or not I found something, which is based off of text on a screen. But the computer has to understand. So I uh, many of you have worked with OCR, optical character recognition. Uh, it's pretty cool. You take an image, you turn it into text uh, that you can do stuff with. Uh, and it used to be sort of not so easy to work with. But now, as you'll see soon, it is really easy to work with. So the Python. It's a real Python talk. Uh, so... Just want to show you. Uh, here is a method that I call the NitPy. I'll get I'll get a link to the source later, and we'll finish the video later uh, to give a brief idea of what it actually does. But we have the Raspberry. Uh, these are some low-level commands uh, that take the firmware under it that say these pins, uh, which you can see in a bit, are going to be output pins as opposed to input pins for my circuit. Uh, so we need to put the joystick, like I was saying. Uh, the implementation this is this I squared C, thank you, we got it right. This I squared C protocol uh, that people are alluding to. Uh, we will write it to the bus to specify what partial voltage is applied to the output. Uh, so we just have a little thing called level here. I know because I'm the author, it's an integer that is modded with this, which is 4096, obviously. <laughs> so, uh, so F, that's uh, eight. Four bits, four bits, right? So uh, the DAC can say 12 bits, DAC, which means it can take 12 bits to specify a ratio, 12 bits, 496 signals. So any number between 0 and 4,096 uh, is applied as a ratio of the voltage. So you say 2,000 is roughly half, for example. Uh, you, you do the bitmap here, they have to come across as a list of bytes, do a little shuffling. Felt really cool when I did that. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's a little yeah. Tilt. So, uh, tilt is like setting left right with the neutral voltage, which I have a uh, plus a number, which I pass in. Uh, and yeah, when you tilt, when you have tilt, you start going places. So, I had to go right here. So, going right, as you may have guessed, is applying a voltage to the x-axis. Uh, I guess negative in this direction was right. 
and then holding it there for a little bit because that's what happens in real life when you flip the joystick, it's there for some amount of time. Uh, and then, yeah, going still, it flies up new messages to the thing, so your character stands still. Uh, and yes, kind of the coolest uh, code in all my slides, uh, reading the crop image. So OCR is not a super easy thing, uh, but on this rad guy, on this little hobby project of mine, uh, reading an image from a screen and turning it into text to make a decision on, here's all the code. And you don't even need to try accept, really. I put that in there. Uh, because funny story, it didn't work all the time because it can always supply the required power to the webcam because I was powering my circuit. That was my bad. I should have had a battery. Uh, but, you know, just going to retry a loop here. Um, and yeah, what else? Finally, okay, the pickup function. Here's a function that picks up an item, right? Uh, so this assumes your little character is in the right place. So you press A, that makes it reach down to the thing. I uh, have a little retry loop for that power issue I alluded to. Uh, and, and you uh, you know press A a couple times to pick up the thing, get through the message. And yeah, so here's the meat of the demo you're gonna see in just a bit, which will conclude the talk. Uh, is, is this I don't want to start. So hard coding my guy to go to all the places, uh, I had to script in exactly what to do. Uh, and there's no place to look this up because no one's done this. So, uh, for the voltages I picked, or the that I built, uh, to get to item one at the beginning of the special building, we go up for half a second, left for three seconds. Okay, so that was a big build up, and now you're going to see what culminates to, to me as the coolest output with this project, which is a video of it actually doing something. Hey, I'm right where I left off. So pressing A, pressing A. We went through the soft reset. Remember that trick I said earlier? We didn't like the randomized output, so we just didn't save, hold the power, try again. We're going to load to a save point. Uh, let's see. There it is. Selection string. So we're pressing A. All right, there it is. Can you kind of see? See, look, yeah, it's working, right? And then, oh, so, so the failure hit me. So out of six items, one actually failed. This is the one that failed. Uh, kind of a bummer. But you can see, uh, I'm capturing the frame. And I'm getting digital input. And it doesn't work three times. And it says, OK, try again. Yeah, you get the end. I'll cut to the end. <laughs> Oh, okay. And then it's the very last item, and then we decide if we want to restart or not. And bam, there it is. The, the magic right there is the the actual things that came up in the dialog box, parsed by text direct from the camera. Uh, and this one is not the one that failed. All right. Okay. So thank. I have no idea. Oh my god. Okay. Sorry. I'm gonna go. Um. But conclusions. Uh, Overkill for actually doing the thing uh, was a really good project anyway. Um, I spent way more time building the circuit than the thing that I automated. Uh, Solving was the hardest part, actually. If you saw the thing that passed around, I broke a lot of things because I applied too much heat. And uh, yeah, so it's a Python talk, so I'll wrap it up with a comment for Python. Um, it was a great language for it because. Uh, PyTesseract, just downloaded it, it's called Perfectly. Library from Google, written in C++, Python bindings ready to go, compiled to ARM without any uh, on my behalf. Uh, I mean, you could say that, like, I don't know, any language could have done that, but the fact, I mean, for the project, Python is what made it all in the place. All right, and that's it. Thank you. <laughs> yes, uh, you, sir. So you said that it was, uh, that it was Bluetooth and it like mm -hmm. communicates wirelessly. Why couldn't you spoof the Bluetooth signal instead of going to the Good question. detail of ripping apart $80 things? Yes. So the question is, why not spoof the Bluetooth signal instead of ripping apart $80 things? And the answer there is that is not what I had the knowledge to do. 
so there are actually people on that uh, GitHub repo I was alluding to earlier who are discovering the very same thing and sort of taking apart the protocol and figuring out how to actually do that. Uh, but this method was more accessible to me and I wanted to try something like right now. Okay, that's it. Another. Did you get the gold bottle cap? Yes, thank you. I got two gold bottle caps, uh, but didn't use them because you have to like get your Pokemon to level 100, and like I didn't want to make the time for that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, oh, yes, good question. Am I hooked into the TAS community, Tool Assisted Speedrun? Uh, I am aware of them. And I would say um, I'm not super into it, but I've definitely sort of plugged myself before, waiting for people to, if they're interested, they can ask me. Um, the truth is, the, the Deku Nukem, the, the modder I alluded to in the beginning with the repo, um, he has a circuit that is, uh, well, it must be more advanced than mine because I couldn't understand it. Uh, or, I don't know, maybe it didn't work. Uh, but uh, there, there is certainly stuff out there kind of like this that does similar things. Thanks for asking. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Sorry, I went long. <laughs>